So uh, if we're both ready, we're going to start this interview. And hi, everyone. Welcome to 2023 FOF Talks with Dr. Fan Yun from University of Chicago. And the first part of today's interview is going to be the introduction of our honorable guest speaker. First of all, Dr. Yan is the research assistant professor at the University of Chicago, and she directs the human nature and potential lab. Her research program focuses on the big questions in our lives, such as the factors that give rise to meaning and happiness, the values we endorse and pursue in life, and the kind of person we aspire to be. Dr. Yan's current research focuses on our natural tendencies and potential to transcend ourselves in terms of the moral, emotional, and motivational aspects of the self, which are topics we will focus on. On today. And if there's no more follow up from Dr. Yang, I think we'll move on to our first part of the interview. If someone asks me what is something you spend most time pursuing and what is something to be pursued throughout your entire life, I would offer the same answer to both questions, and that is happiness. In the first part of the interview, we're going to discuss this very familiar yet complex concept based on her 2020 work, Happiness is from the Soul, the Nature and or Origins of Our Happiness Concept. And the first question today is about a term that was mentioned in your work, Dr. Yang. Can you please introduce the happy victimizer phenomenon? Yes, sure. Um, happy victimizer is actually a phenomenon that has been discovered a long time ago. Like I think it first appears in the 1980s, 1990s. Um, so basically it, it, it is an um, effect about like young children. So when you tell young children, for example, someone who does something bad, a moral transgression, for example, such as pushes someone off the uh, swing so that, mm -hmm. so that he could play the swing himself. Um, then if you ask young children, how the person who does this bad thing to get what he wants, how does this person feel? Young children typically will say he feels happy. So basically they, they think, you know, being a victimizer, um, as long as you get what you want, even if you hurt others, is actually makes you happy. So that's the happy victimizer phenomenon. So for older children, like above uh, age seven, um, and also for adults, actually, uh, we still attribute happiness to that victimizer, but we also uh, tend to attribute like mixed feelings. We also attribute some kind of sadness and also like a, some kind of like a guilty bad feelings. Yes, I see. And this is also closely related to the moral judgments we're going to talk about. So the second question is about the observation you have made in your work on moral judgments. Why do people determine happiness with moral judgments even more than the agent's subjective states? Right. So this is a really good question, especially put together with a happy victimizer phenomenon, because as the first side, I think the happy victimizer phenomenon has left in people's mind that, you know, we start out not really caring about other people's interests in terms of like our own happiness. Like young children only care about, you know, whether a person fulfills their own desires, um, it doesn't matter whether they hurt others, whether they, what they do is morally wrong or not. But actually my findings kind of like uh, contradict that. So we actually have found that, you know, children as young as age four or five, they actually think, you know, bad people are not happy. Even if you tell them, you know, the bad person could get everything they want. So for example, in one story, we actually told them, you know, this um, nice person, who spends most of time in a hospital helping others actually has fewer uh, subjective, fewer like a uh, good feelings than mm -hmm. uh, a mean person who spends most of his time stealing other people's toys and and enjoys playing with them. So in this case, we are pitting against you know like um, niceness versus meanness, um, uh, moral character versus um, the subjective feelings. So. Um, in this case, we ask, you know, who is happier? And actually, you know, young children and adults, they actually think, you know, the nice person who has fewer good feelings than the mean person in this case actually is happier um, than, the, than the mean person. So basically, this is, I think, like a, about your question. So this suggests, that, you know, children and adults, they actually perhaps weigh uh, moral character more than subjective states when they think about happiness. 
So it means like uh, young children definitely care about um, people's um, moral moral character. Um, it's not like they only care about whether the person fulfills desires or not. Um, so in terms of why we find this um, effect, it's a very interesting question that I do not have a good answer for. And also in general, you know, it's very, why questions are usually very hard to answer yeah. because you can actually answer it at different levels. I mean, for example, I can answer it in terms of methodology. Why we find that, but you know, the happy victimizer people, they didn't find that. Um, so I can say something about the methodology. So basically happy victimizer phenomenon, people, they typically do not compare, you know, this, this victimizer with, you know, someone who gets the swing with a morally good means. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess if they do the comparison, you will still see, you know, like, even though children think like the happy victims matter is happy, I don't think they will, they will actually say, you know, that person is as happy as the person who gets the swing by doing morally good things. So right. basically that's the comparison that was not done in previous research, but that's exactly the comparison here in our paper. So we're trying to show, you know, compared to a good person, how 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 does a bad person feel, you know? Um, so I think that's that's one major thing. Basically, we are revealing something that does do not necessarily contradict the literature. It's just a, more of a, something like previous literature did not do before. So we are revealing some kind of children's ability or sense of sense um sensitivity that has not been done in previous literature. But I think like uh, perhaps it doesn't. There could be other methodology differences that um I I do not evidence for to say you know like uh, whether they account for the effect or not. But we can also um think about other potential reasons to answer this why question. So mm -hmm. for example, like it's also like we are studying children's happiness concept. It's different from you know like. Happy victimizer phenomenon is more about like, it's like a theory of mind questions. It's a mental state, um, almost like, a, so they really emphasize, try to think about how that person feel. So in our in our study, we are, or we care more about, you know, like, how do you think, um, what do you think whether that person is happy or not? So it's more about their own conceptions or notions of happiness. So some older children even say, you know, that person may think he is happy, but I do not think he is happy. So in other words, our work is more about, you know, what you think, what count as happiness for you? Um, and we, we find that for young children, actually moral judgment care, uh, matters a lot. There is, could also be, you know, like even deeper, longer, like evolutionary reasons. So basically one um, general conclusion from our paper is like, you know, moral judgments and happiness attribution seems to have a very close link in children's mind. Perhaps, you know, like it served some kind of evolutionary reasons. Like if we all feel, you know, like doing morally good things makes people feel bad and doing morally bad things makes people feel good, then what kind of world we're going to live in, right? Like our yeah. species probably will die out. So I think it's not, it makes evolutionary sense that there is such a very close link between um, what we think about happiness and what we think uh, about moral judgment, yeah. Right, and this is also one of the first times that researchers have found that moral judgment matters so much in young children, because I also look at the first part of your paper that says most researchers tend to think, probably like the developmental theories, they say morality only develop in older children. So I think yeah. on this interesting point, we have another extension question. That is, does children's and adults' consistent emphasis on moral characters when determining one's happiness imply that individuals also acquire happiness? Is by behaving morally? That's a very good question as well. So um, because our paper actually focuses on what happens in children's mind. Um, so basically how they think about happiness, how they make moral judgments. So this question is essentially about their actual happiness experiences, actual happiness 
feelings in themselves. Um, so this paper, we do not have um, anything to speak or answer this question, but there are um, works like that, like among adults and among children, showing that, um, so basically, they have they have shown like giving a resource to others actually makes children and adults happier than even than receiving a resource uh, themselves, which is very um, interesting because it suggests you know like uh, doing this morally um, good action even at a cost to the self actually makes people happy, even compared to you know receiving a, a benefit for the self, um, so. So basically there is this term called warm glow, uh, which describes it, you know, the kind of like a warm fuzzy feelings like we feel in our heart when we do something morally good. So basically that is kind of a happy, good, good feeling. Um, so it seems humans are naturally equipped with these kind of emotional benefits when we do morally good things, which again is very consistent with the uh, evolutionary uh, view that probably, you know, doing morally good things is, is very rewarding. Um, I mean, it's a very good mechanism for facilitating people to do per social actions to each other. Yeah, um, but I also want to emphasize, you know, like we have the capacity to derive happiness from morally good things. Doesn't mean we always derive happiness from behaving morally. You know, sometimes when the stake for ourselves is too high, uh, when we feel, you know, cost is something we cannot tolerate, or we feel, you know, like these per social actions are kind of not done by choice, but by social pressure. So, so it's less likely we're going to derive happiness. Uh, so there are some recent findings showing that children show the greatest happiness by sharing a resource um, when they can witness the receiver's positive reactions of receiving the resource. So in other words, like, you know, seeing other people happy um, as a result of your own moral actions actually add to your happiness. So uh, although like, you know, being uh, anonymous, you know, do-gooder is good, it seems like we do enjoy, you know, seeing others' positive reactions. It's almost like, you know, our own happiness and other people's happiness are actually very linked together. Yes, I get it. And it's also one point that, that our club emphasizes when we talk about mutual support. And this is actually really surprising when I heard about this giving out the resource, because <laughs> I, we always think children are they're self-centered and they might be selfish. But this is a really new theory that's actually rebutting our false common sense. But let's also talk about the opposite side of morality, that is immorality. Can we infer from moral judgment's unique role in happiness that anxiety or depression indicates a potential immorality behind one's behaviors or minds, a potential immorality in the surroundings, or a potential inconsistency between one's moral judgment and the descriptive world? Mm. I think this is a good question, and it's also some kind of... Um... Uh, common misunderstanding, like a from like an inference from our work that I hope to make very clear. Mm -hmm. So I have at least two things to say about this question. So first, um, so our results is more about you know how moral judgments affects happiness judgments. So we did not have the reverse evidence about whether we make um, we make moral judgments based on happiness. So for so basically we show you know people think bad people are not happy. So what we didn't show is whether we think happy people are good. Right. Or or unhappy people are bad. Um I mean it's possible. It's possible, you know, like when we see a happy person, it's easier for us to associate that person with moral goodness. We think that person is friendly, probably is trustworthy and stuff. Um, and when we see like a, a person who always seems angry, sad, frowning, like we tend to think that person is morally bad. Um, mm -hmm. So, or a person with a depression or anxiety, you know. Um, but I think first we, we we have not we have not studied that. Um, it's a, it's a good empirical question to find out. Well, if we sometimes may think you know people with anxiety or depression 
we may actually think they are morally bad. Or maybe we think their anxiety or depression is a result of their underlying bad moral character. So first, we haven't shown that. And second, if we found that result, so for example, if people really think people with anxiety or depression um, signals, you know, moral badness, I think is is not a, is not um, is not a necessarily a real um, perception. Mm-hmm. It's, it's only a perception. It doesn't really mean, you know, anxiety or depression definitely means like potential immorality. In fact, we know a lot from clinical psychology that, you know, anxiety and depression have like a lot of other causes, like a lot of them even are out of the person's control. So for example, depression has really, you know, like a, um some physiological, you know, like uh, underlying reasons that we we actually should view the person as, you know, someone we should care for um, is not necessary. I think most of the cases actually are not caused by their own uh, immorality. So I, I think it's kind of a stereotype. If we do find that kind of stereotype, I think it'd be nice to combat that and to help people to realize you know, like these are not things like people can totally control um, and they actually need help rather than be condemned because of their their um, their troubled uh, state. Right. Yes. Um, when we talk about this question, it's also really harsh to think about it because a lot of people themselves, when they have mental illnesses, they also can't discover what's going on. So a lot of depressed patients also tend to blame themselves. They think, have I done something bad or immoral? But if, as you mentioned, this research like stereotype really comes out and we say it's actually not true, then it would also be helpful for the patients to recover. And I think the last question. Yeah. You have any- yeah. And I, I do feel, you know, like um it, it's like add 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 salt to you know, like to a cut. It's like they are already very helpless and, and feel very painful. So if people also think, you know, you deserve this because of what you done, then um they're not going to receive the help and they actually will be hurt even more. So so that's yeah. not going to be good. And our paper definitely don't support that so yes I get that from your paper um and this is a when we go back to the depressed patients it's also what we concern when we're talking about adolescents mental struggle because a lot of our students aren't happy and that's why we focus on your paper of happiness so I think the last question would be on pursuing happiness and considering the importance of moral judgment what can adolescents do to acquire happiness and alleviate our sense of anxiety and fear yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's also like a, what we hope our work could help people with. Um, so basically, I have I have two things to say about this. Um, in general, you know, like when we think about happiness, it sounds surprisingly simple. Like, but it's also surprisingly hard to know. Like, you know, what it is. I think the the basic reason for this is like, you know, a lot of things can make us happy. Um, you know, eating ice cream, you know, like learning, playing video games, you know, like in terms of happiness, subjectively, um, they all like, uh, they all count. But the thing is, objectively, the activities actually differ a lot in terms of, you know, how good they are to yourself and to other people. Um, so, so these are the two things I want to say. So first, our paper does not mean like, you know, good feelings or hedonic pleasures or desire satisfaction do not matter for happiness. They definitely matter for happiness. I mean, like, uh, so our, our paper only tries to say, you know, moral judgment also matters for happiness. So the first thing I want to say is do not feel guilty when you feel, you know, you want to satisfy your natural desires of eating ice cream, you know, playing video games, yeah. um, or like other good activities, like spending time with friends, have families, um, like 
just enjoy like uh, things you naturally enjoy. Um, so that's one thing because that you know is what we live for. Is why life is worth living and and feels good. Is is important. So the second thing is we want to also qualify <laughs> our enjoyment a little bit. Um, so that means you know like among all the things we enjoy doing. Try to you know categorize them a little bit. Use your own moral judgment about you know like about two things. You can ask yourself like how good this activity is for yourself and how good this activity is for other people. Um, so this happiness paper shows mainly about it. You know our uh, actions for consequences for other people matters. But we have another recent paper showing you know like consequences for the self also matters for happiness. Like young children think, you know, if some favorite activity, um, if it's normatively bad, such as it's forbidden by parents and it's bad for their health, they actually think, you know, doing those favorite activities do not make them as happy compared to, you know, normatively good um, activities. So that means, you know, like consequences for ourselves actually matters. You know, some activities, they are just more able to get you further in life, to help you improve yourself, you know, to give you a brighter future compared to other activities. So, for example, like a video game playing, probably I will I will do a study at some point about this because it's such a big phenomenon. And yeah. <laughs> um, I know a lot of people have difficulty break out from it. So that gives you happiness even more intense happiness compared to, you know, the type of happiness you get from, you know, spending time with friends, families, or spend learning new stuff. Um, but the thing is, in terms of, you know, objectively, what good it does to you, if you think about it, does it make you a better person? Does it give you a brighter career? Um, does it, like, uh, help you learn new things and become more competent? So if your answer is actually an honest no to these questions, then you can ask yourself, you know, is this the only thing I enjoy in life? So are there things that I also enjoy, but are also good for me um, that can give me some, you know, like, um, so allow me to say yes to all, all my previous questions. And also you can ask yourself, you know, how good does this, like, a uh, activity mean for other people? Does it bring any happiness for others? Does it help promote other people's interests? Does it allow you to contribute to society like a broadly um, in, in your future? So if the answer is also no, then you can think, you know, are there activities that, that allow me, you know, to make a broader impact beyond myself that I also enjoy? So I do not believe, you know, like all the activities we enjoy are, you know, things that are harmful to the self and harmful for others. So there are things that, you know, are both good and pleasant, you know, to do. Um, so I just hope, you know, like the more you're able to pursue those activities, the more you can reap the benefit from the greatest benefit. You both feel the enjoyment and you also become better version of yourself and more useful for others and society. So that's the things I want to say. Um, a little bit sen a sense of anxiety and fear. I mean, I think that's a more specific question compared to what I just said. I, what I said is just a, you know, a general thought about pursuing any kind of activities. Um, but I, I also think, you know, anxiety and fear, it, probably different people have different you know reasons for feeling these kind of emotion but I guess like for students your age is a lot of them is about you know academic pressure um, uncertainty about the future so I think if that's your source of the anxiety and fear then doing activities that are good for you not just enjoyable um, is is the key so basically I feel you know like if you keep doing activities that you enjoy but are bad for you, you will only feel more anxious and fear because you, deep down, you know what you, you are doing is not useful for yourself. And so you feel this, you know, conflicting um, feelings and why why feel that? Like, 
so doing good things and 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 feel the enjoyment and you know like and knowing you know knowing you are doing good actually makes you happy even just this this clean conscience you know so what i think is most important is just just one 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 thing like if your conscience is clean then you are happy so do things that you know do not leave yourself in in a, in a place that you would feel conflicted and and struggle with with us any sense of guilty i feel i trust that every one of us already know what's good for us yeah. even if you are addicted to something that you know like at this moment i know like it's it's very hard to not know this because of all the societal and parental values um you know around yeah. us so I, yeah. Um, yeah i'm just trying to give you one more reason to pursue those good things um, because they are good for you and they also are in, in, enjoyable compared to you know things that are enjoyable and not not good so so you you tell me which one is better to pursue right <laughs> so it's a very obvious answer yeah right and I think you mentioned something very important. It is when we talk about academic pressure, it's also because a lot of our students don't understand why am I studying hard? I don't feel like that's important. So I guess what you mentioned that you call it a general, but we also think is really important is we have to truly know ourselves and what we want to pursue, like our inner desires. Like, for example, we have to negotiate with the environment. Like, for example, if I if I don't I don't like math, I probably can pursue English more. And that's my personal example. And also we make compromises when we were pursuing uh, in the status quo. And we also can communicate with our families, for parents, for assistance to help us to realize our actual inner desire. But yes, I definitely think what you just talked about is really important. We will for sure emphasize that about truly self-observation and self-actualization in our club. And I think the first part, yeah. Um, so I think that's a, also a good point that, you know, like in this case, I don't think like the question is about pursuing things that are good for you. It's a question about how to get more enjoyment. Um, yeah. Because I said, actually both matters for happiness, like doing good things that you totally hate doesn't get you happy either. Um, so of course it's actually I think it's harder to to force yourself to get enjoyment from something you do not naturally enjoy. Um, but there are some ways that you can help with that too. So for example, I don't know if you are familiar with the concept of flow. Um, so basically it de describes this intense um, moments of joy that you even forget the time, you forget yourself, you are totally absorbed in an activity. Mm -hmm. So basically theoretically you can tr transform any activity into a flow activity even like uh, driving or changing diapers so i think for math it's possible <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, so basically it's very very easy like it just requires you know your ability matches the task challenge so that's the key for for you to experience flow so if the challenge is too great then you will feel frustrated. If the challenge is too, um, too low, then you feel um, bored. So basically to try to find the best match between act uh, your ability and the challenge. And also like there needs to be um, immediate feedback, which I think is the case with math. You, you definitely, you can't even avoid the immediate feedback, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I feel a lot of, you know, like a, a lot of the reason like we don't like math um, is actually because we, we are anxious about how we perform compared to other people, you know, like it's, it's not really about like math, it's so, so boring. Um, there is a lot of beauty to, to math and to any subject. Um, so it's often the social pressure that gets in the way for our enjoyment. I think that's another topic we can also talk and and some people may have a really good question of that and I will be happy to comment more yeah later yeah totally and that's that's true when I do math I always think that my classmates are doing better and that's so immediate feedback that I feel frustrated to answer the next question 
And I think I think one of the questions in the second part also touches on this on uh, this point. But yes, let's move on to the second part. In this part of our interview, we're going over and discussing the questions we collected from our students on emotions and life pursuits. And the first question is, Dr. Ying, why did you choose to study psychology and why did you decide to study human transcendence and potential? This is a great question because, and I, I also appreciate that you separated these two questions because they have very um, different answers. It's easier to say how I, um, it's, it's easy to say both, but it was easier for me to study psychology than for me to, to decide what exactly the thing I want to study. So basically study psychology was very easy for me because, you know, like as a child, I always enjoy reading and writing. So I, 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 what I enjoy most is actually not any subject. I, I enjoy thinking about life and reading about life. So I hope there could be a discipline that, you know, specializes in, in life. Uh, but it turns out I, I do not think it's a, it's a, it's a subject. Yeah. Um, there's no such a major. <clears throat> so I think like the closest I could find perhaps is philosophy and psychology, I guess. And um, in my college years, I I knew I want to I wanted to you know do a PhD abroad, um, and perhaps in America. Um, and my thought at that time was very simple. You know, if I do a humanities kind of subject, they require very high language language skills. So uh, I feel you know I I would rather do something that you know more empirical, so that you know it it is. You have some kind of reality to hold on to. It doesn't necessarily have to come all from your own mind and from your own mouth. <laughs> um, so psychology is kind of that kind of compromise. Um, it makes me feel, you know, like so. Another extreme would be, for example, something like physics. Like the, the people from all the world speak the same language in terms of physics. Like they don't have to speak much. It doesn't matter whether your English is good or not. So I can't study physics. I'm more interested in people and life. So I study psychology. Yeah, that's easy. Um, so I, so I, I double majored in psychology. Um, and then, but to find, you know, my own direction is, is super difficult. I mean, even today, I still am constantly shaping my research program. So I feel, you know, like all this, you know, uh, process have led me to realize, you know, probably there is no career that is ready-made for any person. So when you enter the field, for example, when I studied, I studied developmental psychology, it was based on, you know, a misperception from my side. I'm always interested in, you know, questions about how we can become better, uh, how we can live a better life, you know, um, how we can become, um, improve ourselves. So I was thinking, you know, developmental psychology, it sounds like how we develop, right? So that sounds like <laughs> the right field to be in. But when I was in the field, you know, it's nothing like what I thought of. It's mostly about normative development. It's about, you know, what happens between three and five, five and seven. So all the humans go through a very similar trajectory during that process. You know, before three, before five, you, you don't necessarily understand the false belief. After that, you understand that. 95% yeah. of children go through this. And it does not tell you, you know, after you acquire the basic abilities, how, basically my question, like, how do we become better? How do we live a better life? It says nothing about it. It doesn't even say much beyond the, the age of 14. So, <laughs> um, so I was in the wrong field. And, and also the whole approach about, you know, describing what happens naturally. I mean, it's, it's of a great interest to some people, but really not for me. So I almost gave up, you know, pursuing a career in psychology after I did my PhD. I immediately got pregnant with, with a kid because I was thinking, at least I can make some progress in my life. Like if I can't find a, a direction to study. But, you know, like uh, those years, like I got very relaxed and I, I was just reading broadly about, you know, psychology not necessarily think about doing any particular project. I was just trying to finish some projects started in graduate school. Um, but then gradually, you know, like I started to, to, to find out, you know, there are some studies in the field that actually 
I feel more drawn into. Like for example, um, questions about happiness, about meaning, about you know how we um can contribute things beyond ourselves. I feel you know these are actually my topics. So and there was this like a um postdoc fellowship um is is an application that um people basically could submit a application to apply for a postdoc fellowship studying happiness. So at that moment, you know, happiness sounds like a very, very foreign word in environmental psychology. It's, uh, even today, I, I don't now think of other people besides me actively study it. So um, we don't know what to study for, for happiness among children. So basically, we just uh, got together with, you know, the PI of my, my lab at that time. And we say, so given this opportunity, what's the most interesting question to ask about children? And then we found the happy victimizer studies and we were thinking, you know, maybe we can base on that and, and study some, something related but different. And that's basically totally set off my career to a totally different new direction. So it's not just about that single paper, it's about, you know, this whole realization from my side about, you know, you can study anything um, with with your, your research skills. And I would, I, I would just, uh, be more brave to pursue, you know, what the questions I have been interested in for years. I'm, I'm trying to relate all my questions based on my real life reflections and experiences. And that is about like a human transcendence and potential. So um, yeah, so that's how it took me almost 10 years to figure out I could do this. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> It's it's really a long journey, and especially when you tried out developmental psychology, but it ended up in happiness and meaning. I think it's also the first time that I see a really, it's actually like a really good professor at at a great university and studies happiness. When I read about the work, I'm also like, oh, I can understand it. It's like it's like so <laughs> exciting for me to read because it also concerns every reader, every student, and every I would say ordinary individual when they read about the psychology topic. So, definitely, there is a field of positive psychology that yeah. a lot of people study happiness among adults, um, but for children, I mean, like it's it's um it's very new, and also for the positive psychology, I think it gets a mixed reputation. So some studies are done in very sloppy ways, not very rigorous. So it's like a you know happiness is this flashy, sexy topic, um, <laughs> that people naturally do not believe it sounds very academic already. And if you do not do it in a very rigorous way, <laughs> um, yeah. people just discount it altogether. So so I try to, you know, um, bring any topic, you know, is from life and from our common popular interest, but I try to study them very rigorously and link them to profound philosophical foundations. Um, so we can give it a, a intellectual elevation <laughs> uh, in the yeah. study, yeah. And that that is in fact important when we are researching what can help us students with mental health problems. Actually, happiness is the first word that comes to us because that's everything that we live for. And actually, when we talk about happiness all the time, we can talk about the second question. One student asks, how is happiness defined? That's a great question. Actually, you can view our paper as an approach to try to find out how people define the happiness. So everybody can have a definition for happiness. Um, we actually explicitly asked this question to a sample of adults. And, you know, different people say different things. Some say it's a feeling. Some say it's, you know, like a, about um eating ice cream, <laughs> like literally yeah. some people just give examples of what make them happy. No one actually mentioned the moral goodness. <laughs> so, um, so basically when you ask people to explicitly define happiness, even for me, if if we just say it without any context, I would say it's just a you know, kind of mental state, right? Mm -hmm. So what our paper tries to reveal is you know, our implicit definition instead of, instead of explicit definition, implicitly, Actually, moral goodness um, matters a lot in our conception of happiness. It's very hard to imagine, you know, a bad person being truly happy. It's almost feel very cognitive dissonance to think of this. Um, so if 
if now, based on our findings, now you ask me like what is happiness, then I would say it's a type of uh, positive mental state um, when you do what is normally good to do. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And it also, yeah, also has, it has to be beneficial at the same time with happiness. And right. Well, yeah, at the very base level, it's just a positive mental state. But I think typically, like uh, what we think, what we would say someone when we when we are willing to say someone is happy is typically about, you know, when the person is morally good and doing good things. Um, at least it, it, it shouldn't be morally bad. It, it can be morally neutral, like eating ice cream, I think is, is morally neutral. Um, yeah, but uh, so so I think we can define as a mental state, except that we implicitly may also have this, you know, normative goodness part uh, embedded in, in our conception. Right. And in fact, I think the next question is already answered when this person is hesitating between watching TV and preparing for exams, I think it's quite explicit that it was mentioned and explained that yes, find the balance between happiness and probably just limit the time you watch TV and then right. exam preparation. Exactly. Uh, I wouldn't recommend, you know, eliminating our enjoyable activities altogether. Because different activities give you different types of happiness. I really feel there are 50 shades of happiness. Like uh, you get all different types of, you know, happy feelings. Like eating ice cream gives you a different type of pleasure from watching TV, from learning, you know. So I feel like having all of them in the right amount is what makes our life diverse and, <clears throat> and add richness to our life. So the key is we cannot... Uh, limit ourselves only to things that you know you enjoy and do not do anything good for you um so if i could choose i would you know like uh, give more proportion to things that i enjoy and also are good for me and then some room for you know things i enjoy but are neutral or even like a a, a little bit bad if I, if i do a lot so, so that's why I try to limit those amount, but I do not necessarily in, in, eliminate them from my life. Um, so yes. we're here, we can't be too hard on ourselves, but we also don't want to, you know, live in a state that is lower than what we could potentially actualize, right? So, yeah. Um, I I think it's once and it's popular in in our among the adolescents we only live once and I I personally do agree with that I also act <laughs> upon this this principle and um the next question is what emotional experiences typically symbolize self fulfillment? Mm, what emotional experience typically symbolizes self fulfillment? That's very interesting. So um. <clears throat> Mm, so it depends on what you mean by self-fulfillment. If you mean like it's the objective state of, you know, achieving everything you want to achieve, or if you want to mean like self-fulfillment as, you know, this like an inner, inner state. Um, so, but I, I feel like the question essentially is about, you know, like, um, so what are our optimal for example subjective state right like so if self-fulfillment means like you you fulfill kind of the optimal state of your inner experiences so i mean actually aiming for happiness is aiming for too low for us that's what i would say so um as i said even for happiness there are different ways there are different you know like each different activity gives us a different shade or different uh, feeling of of happiness but beyond the happiness like the typical you know um pleasure pleasant enjoyable feelings there are also greater emotional states that are rare um to us but will greatly elevate our inner state so for example um the the feeling of flow that i i mentioned like uh, some minutes ago it's yeah. actually the intense form of positive feelings. Like a lot of people enjoy video games. <clears throat> I think probably it's because they experience flow in, in, in that um, state. Uh, because, you know, the task challenge matches their ability. They get immediate reward, immediate feedback. 
um, and there are clear goals. So these are the conditions for flow to um, to occur. So actually the video games, I think they design on purpose to elicit this type of state so that you become very addicted to it. Um, but you know, my, my point again is like you can experience flow from different activities, not just the uh, uh, video games. So being experience, uh, able to experience flow from more productive activities will will be very important and good for you in the long term. Um, so flow is another one, <clears throat> but there is also this like uh, um, all experience. Uh, we also have studies on all experience. All experience basically is like when you feel you are in front of something so vast, conceptually vast, um, that greatly exceeds your current understanding, that you just feel this sense of, you know, like being in the presence of something much greater than you. And you feel a sense of very small, like your yourself is very small. So it feels really good. Like when you are in a national park or when you are thinking about the universe, or we're uh, learning about a brand new theory or a very expansive music. So they typically elicit those kind of, you know, expansive, um, like all state in us. It feels very good. And it's not the typical happiness feelings we talk about. Uh, it has a lot of benefits for people as well. It makes people humbler. Uh, it make, makes people more interested to explore their surroundings and new, learn new stuff. It makes people feel they are connected to humanity as a whole. So, I mean, these are not the things like eating ice cream can get you with. So right. the whole different level of emotional experience, a lot of religious experience are like, are, are like that. Um, and when we are, for example, as a, like a fan in, in a, like a, um, a sports game or when you are being with a lot of people with the same goals and you, you just feel connected to everybody. So that kind of nice feeling. Um, so I also want to point out, for example, besides like a happiness all and flow, there is also this state of feeling meaningful. So um, I feel, you know, like happiness, it makes it feel, you know, good in a moment or, um, or you can have lots of happiness moment. But meaning is really something you feel, you know, that's what you are born with. That keeps you awake at night and, and makes you happy to wake up in the morning. So makes you feel you have something to work for, to hope for. Um, so, I mean, imagine if you only have happiness compared to you have all these like a nice um, positive state, which, which, which state is more self-fulfillment, right? So... Um, and I want to point out, you know, meaning all and flow also share some commonalities. They are all self self transcendent in a sense. So happiness basically focuses very much on the self, like you know, benefit yourself emotion, uh, like a, a physically eating something. You know, like a, these these are sufficient for happiness. But for the other states I mentioned, they all require a sense of like transcending yourself. Flow means like you focus your mind on something external to yourself, something in the world, you totally lose yourself. All means that you focus your mind on the, how big and vast and mysterious the world is. You feel you are small, like uh, compared to the world. And then meaning means like, so I have papers on meaning as well, means like you devote to something that can greatly contribute to things beyond yourself, like contribute to society. So those are the things typically give people a sense of meaning. So as you see, well, what emotional experience typically symbolize self-fulfillment, I would say self-transcendent emotion, no experiences. Yeah. Okay. So those are not like, as I say, as as common as happiness. So that's why I, I want to emphasize them. If you want to elevate your, your self-fulfillment feelings, try to think about, try to have more self-transcendent emotional experiences. Yeah, like right. all one meaning, yeah. I think it was really a great answer because it lists all the examples that we might need to decide if we are feeling self-fulfilled. And I especially agree with this flow state. That's what I what I feel when I'm reading something about psychology. That's also why I decided to major in psychology. Um, oh, okay, good. I thought you would say when, when you feel when you play the video games. 
<laughs> I'm not a huge I fan of video. Feel, yeah, I definitely can feel flow when playing video games. So that's why. Like, <laughs> <laughs> All right. So this is in another academic study based on yeah. real life experience. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Um, let's move on to the next question. Are success and happiness necessarily related and should pursuits be guided by emotional feedback? I think they're both in some extent answered by our previous discussion that I think the success, if I am right, like I'm guessing, that should be decided by um like the moral moral judgment like who benefits from it if it's actually doing good to the society or ourselves and then balance it with happiness is this yes what... yes yes um i definitely think there could be a better directional relationship like when when you're happier it's easier for you to keep working on the things you're you're uh, you work on right and that basically it's not happiness directly bring you to to success but happiness can give you a lot of benefits like it motivates you to work on things. It also makes other people probably want to support you. They they like happy people, right? So that those are easier for you to get um, success. That those are the reasons why you're easier um, to succeed. And on the other hand, success we all know like success brings happiness. Like I, I do not need to say that. Like if you see like an Olympic, you know, like a winners, they how happy they are. They happy they are so happy that they even cry <laughs> yeah right <laughs> right yeah um but i also want to say you know it doesn't mean like we only um we only can or should feel happy when we succeed i mean like you know so it's it's hard to feel happy you know when you try hard and you still do not get where you want but i i always think you know as long as I try hard, as long as I tried everything I can, then I feel happy. Because based on what I said, like if my conscience is clean, then I feel happy. So those are the deepest happiness I can I can feel. At the end of my life, I just want to say, you know, I have tried all, all I have. And um, I feel that gives me a sense of deep satisfaction that no external objective success can bring to me. Um, in the end, it's, uh, it's about... A, a judgment evaluation of myself right yeah it's it again reminds me of the video game example but I think at this point if that person's still balancing between watching tv or video game and exam preparation I guess this person should try his he's for her best and <laughs> yeah it's it's really a common topic among us students just who tries our best and who is the happiest um, I think the next question, I this is a new area that we haven't touched on. It's about negative moods. Um, what is a good balance of positive and negative moods? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. So actually, um, I do not think you know, like a, a life consisting only positive moods is interesting. Actually, a lot of negative moods they are there for a reason. Like, um, like anger actually motivates us to act and address problems. Um, and sadness actually makes us, you know, like uh, think more. So there are findings supporting these these effects. So I can't imagine, you know, a a, a poet or, or philosopher, you know, being super happy around like. A, <laughs> um, so it's not a state very conducive to deep thinking. So for some reason, so I do think like you know, um, as rich life is and and as sophisticated human beings are, I feel like a like uh, we we definitely should like uh, have have both um so and and also sometimes you know it's not totally um under our control so my attitude will just be you know like um i do not think i can totally control my moves it comes and goes it flows with my chemistry and stuff and what I what I focus on is just do things I think I I need to do do things like I think you know are good for me things that I naturally enjoy and I will let the moods they come and go just um with my activities sometimes I wake up with a negative mood but I start regardless of my mood I can determine my action so I do actions that can lift my moods I do actions that I feel uh, are making progress are productive are making me better um, and then my moods just change 
So some negative moods, I even enjoy them. Like I feel, uh, feel so blue, so sad today. Maybe I, I will write something. Um, so, you know, um, just, just a way of dealing with the, the moods instead of trying to uh, control them directly. So, so that's, that's basically my, my view and my way of living. Um, based on what I know about moves. <laughs> yeah, I, I think, in fact, your perspective is really, really cool that just enjoying everything. And I also personally agree that ex we experience everything. We just welcome them and we live with them. We don't criticize a lot. And especially from professional perspective, right? Right. And I think the key is like you need to do, you need to know if you want to ignore the moves, what you need to do. I think... Uh, our mind always want to focus on something. So if you focus on, you know, the nitty gritty things or small country conflicts or like a, annoying people, like, you know, yeah. your mind can't change. And and there are a lot of, to think about negative people and annoying things. They even deserve more of your attention. Um, but if we can direct our attention, like, you know, like you just let yourself totally work on something that you know that will, be good for you so basically like your moods naturally shift um so at least that really works for me yeah actually that's also what I did when I was stressed out by exams I just listened to music and I indulge into it it really relieves the pain of anxiety <laughs> and, yeah, yeah pressure okay um I think we had a great discussion of this question. And the next one is how to deal with overwhelming pressure and anxieties. Can I benefit from them? This is just entirely a question that we have already covered in the last discussion. So I think we, we can skip this one. Um, mm -hmm. The next one is how to determine my meaning of life. How do I know that I'm on the right track of pursuing such meaning? I think this is really a great question. Actually, it's the greatest question that started off my whole research program. So I had this question like when I was your age, like as a, as a teenager, I really just, I don't know why, like I just one day came up with this question, like why why do I live, you know? Yeah. And I couldn't find a good answer anywhere. So basically I talked to people around us and they just say, you know, you don't have to know this answer in order to live a good life. You just do what you do. Or like, you know, the existential philosophers actually just say, you know, there is no inherent meaning of life. Um, you you just make what you think makes sense for you. I mean, all this freedom actually doesn't help. Um, I really want to, I don't want someone to necessarily tell me, you know, you do this, you're born to do this. But I definitely want a direction um, that I could go in order to figure out the specific meaning uh, in my life. I didn't know like what I what I um would be the thing that I would um feel the 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 calling for in my life yet. And I feel you know like in in retrospect, I think like in the um school structures like we all face in middle school, high school, it's not very helpful for us to figure out this question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because, you know, like, um, if you talk about success or achievement, you can have all of those in, in within the school setting. But if you talk about, you know, like a, a meaning, I feel like a, a lot of students really do not see beyond their school years. So that's why they, it's very hard for them to see. And I have a recent paper showing actually, you know, um, unlike happiness, actually meaning is a very self-transcendent um, thing. So basically, like a, compared to self-enhancement, for example, we care more about self-transcendence when we think about meaning. So as I mentioned, so if you get some benefit for yourself, it's enough to bring out happiness state, but only focusing yourself is not very helpful for us to feel meaning. When we talk about someone who lives a meaningful life, the type of people like spring to mind, like Mother Teresa, you know, like, so, are all people, you know, or Albert Einstein, are all people that have made contributions to people beyond themselves. So that's why I I I, I hope like my work can help people to, you know, um to realize, you know, if you want to figure out what's going to be the thing that brings greatest meaning to your life, 
try to think beyond yourself, try to think about, you know, like, what am I going to bring to the society? So once you finish your school years, that's the life you are going to live. Um, you are going to bring things to other people around you and also to society. So, and that will be the, your greatest source of meaning. So that's why I think it's, it could be a little bit hard for high school uh, students to figure out at this moment. Mm -hmm. But, um, but it, you know, you will, you will be. So if you keep thinking about it, uh, one day probably you will think, you know, what are the things I enjoy? What are the things I'm good at? And how can I use that to, you know, make greater impact? Um, and, and you may be more likely to feel a sense of meaning when you are thinking that way. So that's also why a lot of times we don't see why do we need to study so hard? Why, why do we learn all these subjects? Because we do not see how they can benefit, you know, in the long run. Um, in the long run, probably those do not directly benefit to the society or for ourselves. But people say, you know, education is, is everything that has been left after you forget everything that you have been taught. So just believe in that. Like by studying all these things, you are changing to a different type of person compared to you do not um, get those internalized. Um, but it really takes creativity and takes a lot of self-reflection and thinking to get, you know, what where is your place in this society, in this world. Um, so do not feel bad if you do not know it yet and anticipate, you know, could be a long trip, a long journey for you to figure it out. Um, but I always admire and encourage people to figure it out. I think it definitely makes your life more meaningful even just by doing this yeah it's it's really important uh, sorry especially when that um when we talk about us helping each others how we bring things to others it's actually also emphasizing the mutual beneficial interactions among individuals that's how societies mm -hmm. are connected and in fact this is contrasting the next question that's so interesting that this person asks, I often feel disappointed or jealous when I compare myself with others. Is this a raw mentality? How can I adjust? Yes, it's very, it only means you are human. Uh, so social comparison comes so naturally to us. It's actually very adaptive because, you know, without comparing to others, how do we know how good we are? And right, so we may all feel we are the top of the world. <laughs> Um, so it's natural to compare to others. It, it can be helpful to know, you know, how far we are left behind. Um, I do not think it's totally wrong. I just think it's not sufficient. Um, so only comparing to others. I mean, we know um, actually social comparison is one of the greatest uh, source for unhappiness in life. Um, so in Chinese, we know 不患寡 or 患不均. Right. So that's exactly says, you know, like we would rather uh, everyone is poor um, and we do not want to, you know, get less than others. So it says a lot about human nature. We definitely care about how we compare to others in all aspects, not just grades. I mean, like all aspects, appearances, like family background, you know, you, you imagine. It. So eventually it becomes like, you know, you are comparing to this excellent giant monster that is excellent in all aspects better than you and you will feel you're so bad like because in, right. in every aspect you can find someone who is better than you um it is it, just it's definitely not good for well-being <laughs> and of course you can say well how about let's not engage in upward social comparison let's engage in downward social compare compare i can also compare to you know this imaginary person who is worse to my, than myself in every aspect well i feel that's kind of you know it's a kind of self-deception <laughs> it's like um you, you if you only want to feel good by doing this then then that's fine but i think um that's not the ultimate solution because you 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 also know you know there are people better than you so as long as you only engage in social comparison you cannot escape um the unhappiness so I would say, like, first, try to use social comparison as a positive information source for you to learn about your strengths and um, shortcomings compared to others and try to improve. And second, 
if you want to escape social comparison, you need to develop a very strong inner core. So basically you need to eventually, what you hope to develop is instead of comparing to others, you care more about comparing to yourself, um, compare to your current self, compare to where you think your potential is. Use that as the ultimate judgment for how good you are doing. So basically at my age, I already accept that I will not be the most capable person in the world. So I accept, you know, there are lots of people in all aspects, different aspects, different people are better than me. Mm -hmm. um, and I do not strive for, you know, being first order dominant in any aspect. So what I try to live with is like, as I say, a clean conscience. I think like, I have tried my best. I have realized my own potential. If it's just this limited, then I realize it. Um, then I think I, I I have nothing to regret for. And that makes me feel the happiest. Um, so um, I feel once you become more used to this kind of alternative mentality, it's easier for you to ignore others. And actually when you compare to others, surprisingly, you uh, when you compare to yourself, Surprisingly, you will feel, you know, like you will always make a progress. It's easy to, to get, well, it's easy and hard to get beyond yourself. So, but by being, getting beyond yourself, you naturally actually get better compared to others. So, um, but psychologically, it's, it's so much better than the other way around. <laughs> um, right. So try to, yeah, think about where you are, where do you want to get? only think about yourself, be a little bit more self-centered in this case, um, that will be more helpful. Right. Noted this down. Yes. In fact, this mentality that I, I'm not the most capable person, but I have my own potential. This is every, how everyone is unique. And I think as long as we understand it and agree with it, we're good, I think. Exactly. I think like in the Chinese school system, like right now, everybody is kind of compared to this single, you know, like a standard, even though there are different subjects, eventually we can all average it to a single score, right? Yeah. Um, but later on in life, even now in life, you know, you still have other dimensions. Um, and it's not very healthy to only think of yourself, reduce anybody to this single um, score. Um, mm -hmm. as a measure of the value. And down the road, we will feel like, you know, life become even more diverse. So people go to different industries and fields. There's no direct comparison with, there's no second similar person to you. There are apples and oranges, like no way to compare. Unless you engage in the comparison yourself and come up with this excellent giant monster to compare yourself against with. So then I think the problem is really about to like shift the comparison to, to yourself, to comparing um, to your old previous self. Yes, I think that would be the best solution at this point. And we can move on to the next question. This is the second last question. So this student concerns that good scores and high income are both important to me, but I can't give up entertainment at the same time. How can I find a balance? Yes, exactly. So I think this is related to what we have, like I do not recommend totally eliminate the entertainment, but I would say, you know, at your stage, it's a good time for you to make progress in terms of the self-improvement and, and good scores. So if I have to choose, I think it's um, in the long run, it's more beneficial if you, um, if you prioritize, you know, like a learning more than entertainment <laughs> uh, if you have to divide your time I mean like um so um well my my general thinking is you know entertainment only entertains when you feel you have worked hard enough like if mm -hmm. you have a good week of work then you will truly enjoy the entertainment so um that's how I always think about it um um, and high income, I think that's more about future career like a choice, right? Um, there is nothing wrong with with pursuing high income. I definitely think is is it matters is uh, is good. Uh, everything holding equal, everybody wants to have a high income. It's only when high income, you know, conflicts with something else that you also value. So, for example, I do not think it's worth it if you pursue high income at the expense of your own interest. Um, 
So basically, I I always think is is better for you to pursue what you are interested in and get high income as a byproduct rather than like a pursue what you are not interested in just because you know investment banking gives people high income. So, um, yeah. so the the thought is you know <clears throat> if a if you pursue something that you you are not interested in, it's not guaranteed that you are going to have high income. Um, there's also there are always some some kind of risk, and um, but instead, if you pursue something you're interested in, even if you fail, you still get what you you are interested in. So as I feel like you know there is no no real loss there, and actually by pursuing what you're interested in, it's more likely you are going to be more productive and creative and and lead to higher income in the long run. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so my answer for that will be very clear, and my own choice is, is like that. And I now I also realize, you know, like there are so much things like uh, income cannot give you that a meaningful, rewarding career uh, can give you. So yeah, and I think what our students can learn from this is yes, entertainment is truly enjoyable only when we have worked hard at the first place, especially for students. <laughs> but everyone's remember this. And I think we're moving on to the last question today. It is, is Endeavor the panacea for achieving life goals? Mm -hmm. So basically, um, I definitely think like, if we want to achieve any type of goals is, is is usually like you you need you need to put in a sufficient amount of time and effort. Um, perhaps there is no exception to this. Um, <laughs> so um, the thing is, like effort often comes as very you know like intimidating. Then like uh, we we we're naturally lazy like to some extent. So it's um, it. It, we we hope like there could be effortless achievement, but so this is my way of thinking. Like I feel you know we are born in this life. Actually, um, to be honest, we have to make effort in one way or another. So even if you want to engage in engage uh, in entertainment, you will find like deeply meaningful entertainment also requires effort like it's pretty effortful to play video games actually you know and also <laughs> also like eventually if you do not make progresses in other areas of your life eventually they will all come back for you you have to pay for them uh, there is no way to get around the amount of effort it's like so i i, I cannot say this is objective truth but I can say it's a helpful thought. So after you accept this fact, once you think this way, you know, we have to exert effort one way or another. You will be more motivated to be more active in spend your effort, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Something that's, that's true. You, know, you have to work hard sooner or later. This is what I have observed among, you know, all the classmates that have accumulated over the years, you know? <laughs> Some people play really hard <laughs> at that time, and now now they cannot avoid work hard forever. Like they need to work hard at, at a job and and do not pay as well. And you know, uh, when I say do not pay as well, I do not just mean income. I mean all the life conditions. So, mm -hmm. um, and 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 they regret, but it's a little bit too hard, too late <laughs> for yeah. some people. So I mean. So there is effort always. Um, it's, it's your matter of choice, whether you spend it passively um, or actively, if you spend it early or later. Um, if you spend it in more, um, more productive things or not productive things, if you spend it in ways that could bring you more enjoyment or less enjoyment. So I think one thing we could um, try to do is try to see how we could use effort to bring more enjoyment. Then that is really a win-win situation. And I think flow really gives us some, some indication for that. Um, so structure activities to have clear goals, have clear feedback, have the task match your abilities. So actually, you know, very interesting passive activities, very 
uh, seldomly produce flow. Actually, flow requires a certain amount of effort. It's the right amount of effort that that actually matches your ability. So mm -hmm. sometimes we feel effort is so uh, overwhelming. It's actually because perhaps it's a little bit beyond you right now. So try to adjust the difficulty level a little bit until you feel the right amount of stretch, um, but not too much. And um, so, so basically that's, that's my question. Um, accept effort is a fact. <laughs> um, and then just more think about how you want to do it. <laughs> right. I think most of our Chinese students, it's not that we don't work hard enough. It's just yeah. that we probably work hard in the wrong direction. So it would also right. be a club's duty to find what every student's interested in and wants to. That can right. help some individuals to like uh, maximize the efficiency of their effort. Right, right. Exactly. To put more effort on things that you... Oh, yeah, eventually. So right now you have limited choices because, you know, mm -hmm. the subjects you have to go through. But later on in life, you have so much freedom. Uh, you can definitely choose where you spend your effort. And it's very healthy to be very selective. So right now, you know, I already figure out what are the people I don't want to socialize with. What are the activities I will not do? Probably I will not jump out of an airplane as a sport. Like, you know, you give up a lot of things and that simplifies things. So you can allocate your limited amount of effort to the things that bring the most enjoy, uh, enjoyable feelings and bring you the most self-actualization. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, yes. And then I also concluded from our discussion that probably our current struggles in adolescence, because they are inevitable, also because they probably are evolutionary preferable, they have to come to, they have to be like reflected and like um, observed by us so that they, these struggles are worthy and meaningful and they help us to make our future life choices. That's definitely true. Yeah, I also want to end with, you know, like, Knowing that um, knowing our identity is not like a discovery, it's a, a creative process. So actually ourself is our biggest project in life that we have to create. Um, it, it's a constant shaping process, like reflecting what you are good at, what you enjoy and what other people expect of you and find that place. So do not expect like a, to suddenly wake up to know what it is and feel disappointed that you do not have answers for this. Um, I think it's just a, helps us to mature and to grow, um, to engage in this process. Nobody can do it for you. And I do see people who go through life without trying to figure out these questions. They will take you know existing answers given by parents and society. And I do not think that's very good. I, I really hope everybody can try to, you know, um, be more brave and, and just uh, try, try to shape themselves as, as their proudest project in life. Yeah. And I think this is the last question of our today's interview. And I'm going to end our interview with this quick summarization. So today we have touched on topics of life pursuits and emotions, such as emotional expressions, functions, and that make us happy and worthy. It may be the first time for most of our students to pay careful attention to reflecting on our life pursuits and actual potentials. The life philosophy this the philosophies discussed today will certainly shape our students' mindsets, guide our future life choices, and help us to live happier lives. And last but not least, I will express a heartfelt gratitude to Dr. Yang for all of our students at BID who will learn to have more profound reflection on our present struggles, future life life choices and the eventual life goes through today's invaluable lesson thank you so much for your time and effort and yay <laughs> this is over um, thank you for the great questions um <laughs>